Hello and welcome back to TTTV, the only show bringing you all tattoo related news, events and stories from across the globe. I'm Stephanie. Hello, I'm Louis. On this week's show we're speaking to multidisciplinary artists about their tattoo influence performance art pieces. Louis went to Brighton to interview Alex Beanie, looked for his archive of prints and spoke about his upcoming book Burning Bright. First up, we spoke to some contemporary tattooers who are using the tools of tattooing to influence their contemporary performance art pieces. We spoke to Eulin Rosa, Epithumia Rose and Nathan Nimoj. You there? Hey. Hi. Hi. How's it going? How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good, thank Good, you. Good, thanks. So I was specialising mainly in installation pieces. And yeah, I was mostly doing um, conceptual art and uh, mostly things based on text. How did you guys get into tattooing? I learned by myself four years ago, three and a half. Okay. And two years ago, I taught Emily how to tattoo, or at least the basics. And yeah, yeah and then she just went on herself and did like. I think she does. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I had wanted to do um, an anamorphic piece on myself for a long time. I just didn't really know what to do. And um, then I read a book from um, Charlotte Bronte, and in the book they said that she, every word, every word she chose was chosen absolutely perfectly. And it really inspired me, and I talked to that with Ams, and we were looking for like the perfect word to get on ourselves. Yeah, so we wanted a word that would represent an aspiration. So it couldn't be a long word, it couldn't be too short of the word. <laughs> and then we thought of humble, which I think includes, um, describe very well our, our goal as a human being. <laughs> Having humble on yourself, or when humble is used in a sentence, it's most of the time going to be used in an ironic way. So you can't really talk about yourself with humility, because it's going to be sarcastic. It's going to refer to pride. Um, so it's always like a, it's always a paradox. Yeah. So having humble on myself is both uh, a memento trying to remember to be humble, but at the same time knowing that it's almost impossible to achieve. Okay. At first he was very proud and he really wanted to do it himself. Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing. But then a wonderful moment happened during the performance where he turned to me and he was like, Ems, I really need your help. I can't do this. Yeah. And yeah. that was just a really nice moment of humility of admitting your limits and asking yeah. for help. We're like, since we're doing it, might as well invite people and make it a performance. Then I decided to design um, a scenery to go with the performance. And I went on a ster sterile environment theme. So like surgical, yeah. uh, a surgical room. During the whole performance, of course, in the pools you can't see it, but we played um, a song on repeat for right. the whole time. It lasted for three hours. Wow. Uh, what song so was that? Played, it was uh, Nothing's Gonna Hurt You by Cigarettes After Sex. Okay, cool. And yeah, the intention behind that was to really make the viewer lose sense of time. They kind yeah. of go into this sort of trance where you lose track of time, the same I think yeah. as uh, when you would tattoo. Right, yeah, true. A lot of people didn't even realize that they were sitting there for three hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for my part, I'm really happy about how it turned out. A lot of people showed up, people seemed really into it. Um, I don't think there's a lot of events like this, of like performing, performing yeah. tattoos in a public setting. People are kind of realizing that it's just a tool, it's not like traditional art comes with tattooing, like the tattoo gun is the tool that you yeah. use in whatever practice you want, so it's good, so I respect it a lot. I appreciate it guys. Yeah, have thank a good, you. Uh, have a good day. Yeah, me Thanks, too. you too. Wait, see you. <laughs> nice Bye. 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 There we go. There we go. Hey.
How you doing? I'm Louis. I'm Salim, how are you? Good, thanks. I come from contemporary art background before tattooing. Okay. I did like a bit of advertising and then I was just working in yeah, contemporary art in South America. Where's your shop in Berlin? Uh, it's in Berlin, it's in Meddingham, uh, Kreuzberg, yeah. How's oh, that? Cool. Yeah, it's cool. We are like 10, 14 artists there now. Really? Wow. So, yeah, but it's very big, so it's a lot of space. But it's cool. I had this perception when I started wearing shorts this summer again um, and like going out to the streets and you know like I mean I can see you're also tattooed there's yeah. this moment when you um, start exposing your body a little bit more after the winter and Berlin is a very inclusive open uh, yeah. safe city I would say the safer and queerest of the world from my experience but I still got like all these super weird stares and like these people like talking to each other, you know. Right, and, yes. and I got an invitation to do a performance piece or some action piece or something like in a gallery space. And I immediately thought of um, this feeling I had after this day where I felt super exposed and um, pointed out. And one of the perceptions that I, one of the feelings that I had after this day was I wanted to hide and I wanted to close myself and sometimes I'm like, oh my god, I wish I could have like a clear um, virgin skin sometimes, you know, oh, and just yeah. like put it, put it on for the day that I don't want to be the one that it's like pointed out in the streets. And the other feeling that I had was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna like do it all. Like people need to like start opening their minds and seeing that what I do with my body is my own decision and it's the way I feel comfortable in it and then we need to start like working out together the way that we won't be judging each other you know yeah just by the way we look so I was like okay that's that's interesting I would like to expose myself and push myself to see how I would feel if I was fully covered I just wanted to do something that would make people ask themselves questions you know yeah about yeah especially about this um the way we change and modify our bodies to feel they belong to us better and they represent us better which is why i find so fascinating about tattoos i was like okay i'm gonna collaborate with people that i would really really wa want to get tattoos that's something good about instagram and social media is that we're all connected I just invited, I think, like 35 from them, 28 replied and sent me their designs. It was very funny because some of them really wanted to know where the design was going to be, okay. so they could draw something very specific, yeah, and, and some people just sent flash. And it was like very interesting to see how different artists approach it differently also. Yeah, this. yeah. And it was also nice to have like, um, yeah, active collaborators, you know, and yeah, I feel like the community behind. But it was interesting, when I was fully covered, I mean, I had, I've done stuff on my face also for the performance and I, I don't think I want to ever tattoo my face, but the rest of my body really felt like I was more myself, you know, like yeah, I, could okay. to, I could totally do this and I, I'd love to do this. Oh, right. okay. interesting. I, and I was super naked, I was like, yeah, I had like underwear on, but I was naked in front of the... <laughs> Instagram live plus all the people outside right, yeah, yeah. but as I was putting tattoos in me I felt like I was more getting dressed and more for myself so I was like mm. very protected on them it was very interesting to, to feel yeah, it I guess you are kind of essentially hiding the skin and the skin is maybe the, the kind of naked part of you, like, you exactly know? yeah so I was feeling like less so, and less and less naked as I was getting more and more tattoos. yeah when you don't have tattoos, you start thinking of the tattoos, and as more as you have, you start thinking of the space without tattoos yeah. more than the tattoos that you want to get. Uh, I've got that problem. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you go to that level. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's, there's a lot of cool kind of tattoo performance art stuff at the moment, yeah. and I think like more of it needs to happen for more people to kind of understand it and see it as like the art that it is. Yeah, and I think it's interesting how in the last, I would say, five ten years. Um, Artists coming from other disciplines are starting to use tattoo as a media yeah. and like contaminating their practices with different uh, forms. But yeah, it was a very interesting experience. Thanks Have a good day. day. Nice meeting you. Bye. Bye. Next up, Louis went to Brighton to meet Alex Beanie, personal hero, man responsible for giving me my first tattoos, legendary tattooer, 
master printmaker, recently compiled an archive of all his prints into a book soon to be released called Burning Bright. I was playing around with it from probably 86, 80, 87, doing a bit of hand poking or what have you, and myself and a couple of mates, exactly like it is now really, yeah. but just very few, fewer pe pe people doing it. Mm. There was no one else, there was hardly anybody else doing it, so it was felt really rebellious and fun. So uh, we're talking London, late 80s, so you've got the old guard, you've got Lau, you've got Lau Hardy, you've got Dennis Cockle in Soho, you've got George Bonac in West London, mm. You've got, you know, a couple of the real older guys like Jock and King's Cross, but that's a different ball game and that really is old school. Like Dennis Cockle, George Bone, Lau Hardy, they were doing stuff a bit more interesting. And then you had this guy, Mr. Sebastian, who some people would have heard of, who is an older gay guy who had a very underground, actually now very modern setup. In other words, he had what they now call a private studio. Okay. <laughs> right. um, and he was tattooing and piercing. So he was doing both tattooing and piercing. So he offered a kind of alternative model. As to my own generation, there was basically no one. I mean, literally no one. Which is why I moved to LA in 91, because in LA there was stuff going on, basically my own age group. So my time in LA was very, very formative. I met a lot of people and I felt I'd found a peer group to hang out with, basically. First of all, I worked at the Gauntlet, which is a piercing shop, which was the original piercing shop, and that was on um, on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, the Gauntlet was started by Jim Ward in San Francisco, but he had one in LA too, and the woman I was going out with at the time, Elaine Angel, ran the Gauntlet. Right. So I was with her, and I started tattooing in there, effectively in a private studio inside the Gauntlet, which is a piercing shop, I, and then I moved down to, a shop on Melrose. So yeah, it was the time you know Ed Hardy was big, Tattoo City was going. I knew I'd known Leo Zulueta. I'd been ta tattooed by Leo. So the scene was a little bit ahead of London, but it was still compared to now. There was very few shops really. Right. There was no real rule book to follow then. Everyone was, right. you know I could just do what I wanted, and, and I had ideas. So I was I was doing yeah kind of tribal fusion, mm -hmm. bit of Japanese sort of fusion. Um, just my own style. That's that's where I develop my style yeah. if I've got a style. But as to printmaking, so I did a couple of prints at art school. So you go to art school because you can draw, kind of, and it's better than being on the dole because you get somewhere to live and you get more money than being on the dole. So I went to art school in the sort of mid 80s, late 70s, mid 80s, early 80s, I went to art school and I did, I ended up doing performance art because it just seemed weirder. Yeah. And at the time, anything weirder is what I wanted to do. And I was always quite into kind of flyers and collages. I did collages and then blew them up on, there was a place you could blow it up into A1, which at the time felt like, you know, wow, I can blow, I can blow something up to A1. So I played over photocopying quite a lot, a little bit of screen printing. So my final degree thing, part of it was me doing a kind of lecture stroke rant monologue with a kind of microphone in front of these big, as though I was a kind of politician, you know what I mean, with big posters behind me that I'd photocopied that big and I'm wearing a white shirt and a, you know, shaved head. It's all kind of, a bit, by, by, by this stage it was all like industrial music. I thought right. I was in, you know, it was all kind of flopping gristle, White House sort of industrial music influenced. And I, but I had this backdrop of, of these um, big blow up photocopies, which is a print. Yeah. Photo, photocopies of print. Yeah. So, um, that was my first foray, I guess. I just wanted to do something different and printmaking just seemed like, I just kind of like the ethic of it being relatively cheap. Kind of, you know, tattooing is basically putting a finger up at the art world in a way, saying, fuck you, you can't buy this because once it's, oh yeah, isn't it? It's, yeah. It really is a fuck you to the art world because it's, it has no, the whole art world relies on resale. That, that's, yeah. what, that's what the art, so that's what the Quite, art world yeah. relies on. Is like resale value. Invest in a tattoo piece. You can't invest in a tattoo piece, no. And you've got to commit to it in a way that you've never got to commit to just buying a bit of art. But a print again, I like I like the kind of low low brow and the low tech ethic of it. It's, it's essentially quite simple. It's a multiple, they're kind of throwaway-ish. So I kind of just like that whole ethic, you know, of and printmaking seemed to go along with that. Plus the whole Japanese connection with right. the Japanese tattooing and the Japanese print. If you're into Japanese tattooing at all um, and 
you know, all those shots of the Yakuza guys or what have you, all that imagery comes from print, from Japanese printmaking. So you end up getting interested in it. So I, so, so that was part of the feeding as well. So uh, I just thought I'd give it a go, you know? But the reason I did the book, I was doing a little show at a tattoo convention actually, and um, in Brighton, and the guy there said, do you, do, I did a little demo, print demo show, and I, and I, Put up a lot of my archive on the wall, and I just thought, I just thought to myself, man, if 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 you if this fucks up, if I damage them, putting them up or taking them down, or if something happens and I start to damage them, then I haven't got a record of them. So I thought I'll photograph them all. So I had the whole lot professionally photographed before I did that show um, by a, a professional photographer just so that I had a record of them. Then I uh, emailed Andrew Fingerhut from Raking Light Projects, who I'd known and done a little bit of work with, and he was like, yeah, why not? So um, that's how the book came about. Okay. I mean, basically all the prints I've done really are technical experiments. Okay. Really, that's what they all are. I think one of the things that is good about other art forms that tattooing will never give you is that tattooing actually is really quite restricted. Restriction number one is the client. A, you've got to have a client. B, you've got to do roughly what they want. There's almost no client that has no idea. And if they had no idea, they'd be kind of weird, frankly, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's restriction number one. Restriction number two is it's always on a body. You can't get bigger than a back. Right. Yeah. Unless you're a little swastika, had a go with all those multiple body things. But that to me is too ego trippy, getting these kids to like, it's, you know, you've got to work with the client. Tattooing is very specific. You're, it's, it's commissioned work. You're working with the client. You need to be aware of their likes and dislikes. You have to go along with that. You can't be just writing of your own ideas all over them and doing whatever you want. Whereas any other art form, whether it's printmaking, which I happen to quite enjoy, or painting or anything else, you just get up in the morning and think, oh, what should I do today? I know, I'll make this or I'll do a painting of that or I'll go for a walk and I won't work today. I really think that most tattooers are better tattooers and better people and they're going to be happier if they have a kind of parallel art career going with it because I think it's too much to expect to get it all out in tattooing. I think it, I think it definitely makes you a better artist, it really does. Yeah. I'm a big fan of your real art form is possibly a hobby and doesn't really pay, or it might pay a bit, and yeah. it may maybe one day it pays a ton. You never know. Yeah. But if you but if you set out to do an art form to make money because you need to pay the bills, then I think that you're going to be compromised by that. And I think that's true of tattooing as much as anything else. The book is 98 prints spanning my whole print career. Um, it's going to be softback because I very much want softback and I want it to be affordable. A lot of these hardback books for like eighty dollars or whatever is just too much. Yeah. I don't want to buy a hardback book for eighty dollars, so I'm hoping it's going to be reasonably priced and easy to carry. Softback, not too big, like a like a proper you know cheap art book rather than some big thing. Um, it's published by Raking Light Projects, which is this thing by Andrew Fingerhut who print, publishes prints. Cool. Yeah, and like I said, it'll be a, quite a nice line under my printmaking career. Mm. I'll still I'll still keep going a bit, but look it. Yeah? That's all right. I appreciate it. Really. No, that's alright. No, 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 no. Thanks. I feel a bit bad at dragging you all this way down, but Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next episode.